Beyond Belief as a podcast by, for, and about people who have found a secular path to sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous. Today, my guest is Glenn S., who wrote a wonderful book titled 25 Years of Listening. Um, over a 25-year period of attending AA meetings, Glenn brought a sketchbook with him uh, to these meetings that he used to write down little pearls of wisdom that he would hear at the meetings and also to sketch the people that were around him. So after some time, he realized that he has a bit of a treasure trove here that he decided to share with the rest of us, much to our benefit. So, hi, Glenn. Welcome to AA Beyond Belief. It's so nice to have you here. Hi, John. I'm thrilled to be here. Thrilled. I loved your book. As I told you when I when I was reading it, um, a lot it's it's really interesting. A lot of the little sayings that that you wrote down, I've heard in meetings around here in Kansas City, but a lot of them I didn't hear. And but I got the sense when I was reading your book that I was actually in an AA meeting. I felt like I was at my home group having coffee with my friends. That's that's the feeling that I got from reading your book. Yeah, that's what I, I was actually trying to trying to do. That it's and it's so funny, you know. You, the things you're pointing out, the things that you've heard in your local meetings that you read in the book, there is kind of universality to this, that people really do pick up on things. I've been to meetings in Moscow and Paris and, and Flint, Michigan and everywhere, right? And you keep hearing the similar things. And I thought, this is just awful. That <laughs> These things are just sifting through my fingers like sand on the beach and, and, and they should be shared. They should be collected. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that you decided to do that. So why don't we, um, why don't we start with the story of, of this book by, um, telling your story, you know, what about you? Where, tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got into, uh, this uh, program of recovery of ours. Um, I'm a drunk, I'm, I'm an alcoholic and, um, I came into the program, uh, in 1985. I think at that point, I'm I'm a, a Richard Dawkins atheist, Sam Sam Harris, you know Mark Twain, whatever. <laughs> I should write on the right. I just can't bear that stuff. But at that point, my sobriety meant so much to me. If they would have told me to put on a pink tutu and dance around Times Square, I would have done it. But at, as the time went on, it, it's it's really it's so important to be authentic in your life and especially authentic in your sobriety. So if you're constantly tapping down feelings of, I just, I don't want to hit my knees. It hurts. You know, it's stupid. I, just, I want, I, I have to be with like-minded people, et cetera, et cetera. My good hearted sponsor uh, was a very orthodox guy and, and sadly a Republican. He's now a recovering Republican, by the way. So <laughs> we're, we're, we're very, I'm very pleased about that. But after a decade in the program, I just, I couldn't bear it. I just started slipping away. And one night picked up a, shortly after my 10th anniversary, picked up a drink and away I went for, for five years. And finally uh, got my, my butt kicked one more time yet. One more time ended up back in the rooms and we'll be coming up on my 19th anniversary in February. Um, when I came back, I discovered humanist AA. Um, I, I I tried agnostic and atheist meetings. I t tended to veer away from them because they all they did was talk about God, and, and I really loved the humanist approach, which was, you know, say your piece. You don't have to conform to anybody else's beliefs. Or you don't have to deny your own. Just just be at be at peace with who you are, and around like minded people. And so that that was very energizing. I've I've founded three uh, humanist meetings in in New York City, um, that I'm very involved with, and they're well attended. And uh, and it's that that collective sigh of relief that everybody exhales when they come to a Zoom meeting or uh, the, uh, the 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 traditional meetings where where we, you know, I miss the hugs. You know, they're really lovely. And uh, and so around it, people with triple triple digit IQs who are uh, jamming their orthodoxy down your throat. So we're kind of we're we're a, a tolerant group. 
You know, I never thought about there being a difference between um, the agnostic groups and the humanist groups. And I'm, I'm wondering if that might be something unique to New York. I think actually probably one of the first secular AA meetings in New York was it was originally called We Atheists and is now called We Humanist. Is that one yes. of the meetings that you attend? Yes, that was that was We Humanist. It was a Wednesday night. Then I then I started another meeting called uh, Humanist Two T O O, and then uh, and then uh, Humanist. It was We Humanist Humanist Two, and now we have um, uh, Happy Hour, <laughs> which is uh, just this kind of. Uh, it really should be called We Cross Talkers because. <laughs> Everybody just gets to ramble on kind of the way they might have in the early days of AA before the meeting became so structured. Right. And the uh, people sit around and talk. And, and, uh, it, the, and the, the only problem is nobody wants to leave when the meeting's over. We have to kick everybody out of the Seventh day Adventist church that has accepted us. So. Well, you have a long history of secular AA meetings in New York. That's uh, well, AA in general in New York. So. It's a pretty incredible place. Never more than uh, uh, like a you know uh, three blocks away from a meeting at any given time. So it's it's really kind of a paradise. Mm-hmm. So when you when did you start taking notes at meetings and bringing your sketchbook with you? Well, I'm I'm an artist. I'm a I'm a painter. I paint murals. Um, I, I, uh, I wrote a book um, called Murals of New York City. Uh, it's a big Rizzoli tabletop book. And uh, I'm uh, a, um, I guess I'm a sketchaholic. I, I just can't stop drawing. <clears throat> so I have these little sketchbooks that I would just could stick in my coat pocket. And and uh, whenever my mind wandered, I pull out a pencil and do drawings of the people around. Um, when and and then write down things, just things that you know, obviously. I mean, over I it it really should be called thirty two years of listening, but it's not a catchy title. It's twenty <laughs> you know, twenty two years and three months of listening, but it was it was this uh, uh, just this accumulated thing of things people have said, and the beauty of it these these people were. Uh, scholars or or sages or prophets or you guys a shoe salesman a rotor rooter salesman a banker a bum a, a, a ex con a housewife a hairdresser it was just an ex priest everybody's just this stuff and everybody had gone through the the fire they passed through the fire come out the other side uh more complete than the, they'd gone in. They, they and emerged with this kind of uh, marvelous, hard-earned wisdom. And and so I just, I've got to just write this stuff down. I can boast about this book nonstop because I didn't write it. I just was smart enough to listen and write it down. And then, and the idea of uh, peppering the, the text with, with, the images of the people, which I have to hasten to say, were all altered, so nobody could be. Was that you? And that you know, none of that can go on. So uh, to give it a the the feeling of of being in a meeting, of of being around other human beings, because it is that that's who we are. You know, just huddling together in the dark or what everyone. That's a little too dramatic. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's 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 a kind of book that you know I, I read it from from cover to cover, beginning to end. But this is a book that I could just have around the house and just pick up anywhere. And I can I can imagine a lot of readers would be doing that. Is um, you know you have it divided up into sections where you've got different topics covered that you might find in a, at a reg, at a meeting anyway. So someone if they if they're looking for inspiration, they can go to the section on inspiration or acceptance or whatever. Um, but I can just see someone just, you know, um, having a little bit of a peaceful afternoon and just thumbing through the book and just enjoying the feeling and the experience of, the, of hearing though, hearing what they would hear at their home group or something similar. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. That's a great, a great insight and great compliment. I always thought that people should have at least three copies. One one to carry around with you, so people would know that you were in the elite of the mentally ill. <laughs> a, a, a second one uh, to keep in the bathroom uh, to scare the crap out of you. <laughs> 
drinking. <laughs> and the third one to put under your pillow. So yeah. you never have another drunk dream. That's those are the three, those are the three places, but it's true. You get, and, 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 uh, uh, I like to think of myself as a relatively evolved, uh, person after all of these years and uh, you know these thousands and thousands of meetings i've attended and all the rest of it but every time i i I, it's it's kind of i don't want to say i I hate this stuff about you know cliches about there are no coincidences and of course they're coincidences they're what they call the coincidences (laughs) but to pick up a book and the, the the book and i will find something in there that somehow relates to something i'm thinking about or going through or dealing with and it's true it's it's it, because it's although it is in categories the just the random nature of it is can be can be propitious you know i just thought of something um a friend of mine from my home group is an artist and he actually brings a little um sketchbook to meetings and i'm, I'm wondering if it's because there's that part of your brain I wonder if it helps you actually to listen and participate in the meeting by having that part of your brain working. You, you just you just saw my ADD. In, in <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. yeah. When I when I when I'm drawing or painting, I have to have the television on because otherwise I'll be up running around the, the apartment uh, readjusting the the, the realphabetizing my spices or something like that. You know, yeah, it helps me helps me focus. And I wonder, um, and and you titled the book um, "25 Years of Listening." Why, why did you decide on that title? Well, you know, as a, as I sort of joked about earlier, it was a catchier than 32 years and six months of, of listening. But uh, there was, you know, it's it, it, when I started it or decided to do that. Uh, the, that name just that sort of stuck because it was around 25 years I began thinking you know i really should consolidate these i got these i'm, I'm this spiritual hoarder who has stacks and stacks of these sketchbooks that are you know being to spill out of the closet maybe i should just condense them and and, and put them together so that's, that's what i did and um covid quarantine i would have never you know, every, every uh, cloud has a silver lining. They say, well, the silver lining, this particular very dark cloud was that I can't leave the apartment. Uh, you can see my wife behind me working remotely. <laughs> I know. I would, that's how we are here, too. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just me and my wife and my job. And yeah. Yeah. So, but it, it provided the opportunity uh, to, 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 to seize that opportunity, to seize that moment and begin to put the same together. So that's what's grown out of this last. It was fairly easy to do because of all the material was there. The the big problem was editing it down because it could have been, it's 260 pages or whatever. It could have been a thousand, but, but you have to, you have to, things that are repetitive or kind of, you know, so, so, and, and also the, the humor which I love the humor. I love the humor, the way people can, can joke about, you know, they said like AA is a place where, where total strangers get together to reminisce, you know, and we, and we deflect all the unhappiness and the misery with the only, the primary tool we got, which is our humanity and our humor. The humor is healing. I, uh, I experienced that at my very first meeting. It was the lowest day of my life. You know, I felt completely hopeless, but I was at that meeting and there were people, even at that first meeting who were smiling and they were laughing and they were, I guess it was, you know, and I could understand it because it was that sense that they have escaped. They, they escaped that misery. They're looking at it in the past tense now. And so that humor, that ability to look at the past with a sense of humor like that was, it gave me some hope. That may, and and here I am today. I can do the same thing. But yeah, at the time when it's happening, it's not so. Not so. No, no. I mean, you get that perspective that this people are, are all of this funny stuff was happening, and you 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 put it in perspective by looking back, and 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 seeing it through that that. Um, a lot of humor. There's a lot of humor in AA meetings, and people that aren't in recovery and have never been to an AA meeting, they might be surprised by that. You know, that there is so much humor in our meetings. 
Uh, uh, a, a quick story. Uh, <clears throat> my sister was visiting uh, me in New York from, from Oregon a few years ago. And she, she said, do you still go to those meetings? And I said, yes, I love those meetings. And she said, well, I, I, do you have to go? And I said, of course I have to go. <laughs> but I also like to go. You know, right, they're, they're right. really, well, come with me. Come with me. So she had this vision that we're going to go into a darkened church basement and there'd be a lot of, you know, disreputable looking people with, with tatty shopping bags and muttering about parakeets or whatever, you know, it'd be like this toothless old guys. And she walked into this, this meeting. Uh, it's, it's called Lennox Hill. It's not a humanist meeting. Um, but it, she walked in there and, uh, and it was, people were dressed well. You know, they smiled. They were laughing. There was a woman named Emma who, who baked delicious cookies. So everybody, we didn't know if you were there for the meeting or Emma's cookies. So delicious cookies, cup of coffee, and three speakers got up and they were the best I've ever heard. They, they, they could have been a Broadway show. I would have paid Broadway, <laughs> Broadway prices to sit in this meeting. And she got out afterwards. She was, she, people were introducing themselves. We walked outside. She said, that was wonderful. She said, I feel so great. She said, can I join? And I said, no, sadly, you can't because you're not an alcoholic. <laughs> but don't feel bad about yourself. It's just the way you, you're made. And you're so sorry you can't have access to this. And, then I, and, and that, was, that sort of fed in to the idea of this book, that, that the, the lessons learned, the principles applied, can work in any all of life's messy stuff, if you subtract the substance of alcohol or drugs from these these pearls of wisdom, as you call them, that that it apply if you're a sexaholic, if you're a shopaholic, if you whatever, you can take that same thing and and apply these 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 tool these wonderful tools of understanding and, and growth. What I like about also the title of your book is something that I learned late in my recovery is, in my opinion, one of the um, most effective things about AA is that people listen. Um, it's different. Like, you know, if you go to group therapy, um, you go around the room and you you say something and then your therapist will give some input and then you might hear from the rest of the members in the group. At an AA meeting, generally, usually, you talk and people listen. And that listening is just a huge gift. I mean, that's what people need. And I, I didn't realize it at the time, but, you know, as a, I was a young person when I was drinking and I was having a lot of problems. So, of course, they were the, the, the elders in my life were trying to figure out what, how to fix me, you know, tell, giving me suggestions, telling me what I needed to do and so forth. Don't hear that in AA. In AA, I had people who listened to me. And that skill of listening is something that is um, not to be taken lightly. It's something that since I've been podcasting, I've become more aware of listening you know, as I listen to my guests and how difficult it can be. But you did a great job and, you know, sketching and writing down those notes, I'm sure helped with that. Yeah, uh, thank you for uh, yeah. Though this this the, the that you just nailed it. You know the most important. What greater honor can you give to another human being to listen to, to acknowledge them, to listen to them, not wait to talk, but to actually listen, and to be listened to without judgment. Yes, which is where where else does this happen? It's supposed to happen in churches, but I, I it's don't. It's very think. unique, I think. It's very unique to AA, and it's it's what I what I recall being the most helpful. And it really wasn't until I got into podcasting, really, that I understood that listening is a is a gift that I can that I can give to people, and it's also a skill that I need to hone. Um, I, I discovered, you know, when I my first few episodes, um, I would listen to an episode and I would talk to somebody have a conversation with them. And I realized, you know, I wasn't really listening to that person because the person said something that I really should have noticed and followed up on, or I should have, you know, reacted to differently. And, uh, and it just kind of bothered me And episode after episode, I would listen and I would notice, 
I'm not listening to people. I'm wondering if I do this in my life and I'm sure I do. <laughs> so it, it made me hyper aware of that, um, of listening. And it's something I've, I've been trying to work on since then. But I, I know too, in, in, in meetings, you actually can get proof that people are listening to because you'll say something and somebody else will pick up on what you've said. And so you aren't just, you know, blah, blah, blah. It really, it's a, it's a, a, a the most wonderful connection. And uh, just, and people, and, and also if, when you become a, a regular attender of certain meetings, uh, you know, in New York, I get to see them walking around the streets. It's that sense of community. It's that thing. And when, and when, and I sit down with people who know, pretty much everything that's going on in my life. So I don't hold back at all. Um, you know, I think everybody's going to accept you unless you're a you know, pedophile or a pyromaniac or something. I'm probably going to make some judgments about that. But, but you know, if you're just a, or a garden variety, ordinary human being, you know, people are going to, they're going to, there's, I'm not that unique. I'm not that unique. And neither are they. But we, so we share that our common humanity and it's wonderful to recognize it in each other. So when, when did you decide that you wanted to put this book together? What inspired you to do that? Was there any particular person that, that inspired you to, to do this? My sponsor, my sponsor, uh, a wonderful, wonderful guy. Um, I can say his name now because he's been dead for a long time. His name was Gene Gattel. And he was uh, uh, an addictionologist and uh, came into the pro. didn't really hear the smartest guy I've ever known. And uh, uh, he was a psychiatrist, Park Avenue psychiatrist, a $400 an hour shrink. Boy, did I lock out, right? <laughs> Got a sponsor and a shrink of the deal. And he, and I would, and he would talk about how uh, I would, I would get, I would, Oh, Gene, that was so brilliant what you just said. He said, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do this to me. I am a conduit. That's all I am. I listen and I pass it along. I listen and I pass it along. That's all you can do. You're not that smart. Get that out of your head. But you can listen. You can accumulate knowledge. And and so that, that sort of, that was the germ of the idea that this is, you know, could have called it the conduit would also have been a a good title. And what was the experience like putting it all together? Well, you know, it's, it's funny. Uh, You, you, you listen to those words, you read the words and you say, and you think, Oh, I remember that. That was that guy. And, and, and so it was like memory lane, you know, you know, and, and there was, one of my favorite stories in the book is <clears throat> I was a sober companion to a, a very wealthy guy who'd been uh, um, uh, out of uh, rehab, and I, I traveled with him to to uh, Russia, and we went to a meeting, and it was supposed to have been an English speaking meeting, and we got it wasn't; it was a Russian meeting. And I sat there in the audience and the speaker is speaking just as though we were just down the street and whatever. And, and I understood what he was saying. I remember that from the book. And then they asked you to come back and, and, (laughs) and speak to them, right? That's like speaking to a bunch of Chechnyans, you know, I go, da, you know, whatever the, you know, eight words in Russian and they're all nodding. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So the universality of this thing is, is 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 really wonderful, and I I just love AA. I love what it I love that what it does for people's lives. Uh, I I I so sorrowful to see people who who for whatever reason can't stick with it, and uh, have a lot a lot of people I've known have died. They went back out and they and they and they perished, and and the. The sadness. Why couldn't you? What, what, what was it? What, where did that? Why did this happen? I remember one guy said uh, his name was Thomas, and he he. I saw him on, on the ICU on life support after he uh, drugged himself to death, uh, and 
and he used to say, this is so boring. And I said, if we're not here to entertain you, you have to reach within yourself to find what it is that you can offer, what you can give. It isn't about just you. You know, it's not like the Broadway play. It's not like you're sitting there absorbing what other people have created. You have to participate. It's the give and take that gives this this experience its vitality. So what kind of, um, did you run into any obstacles along the way as you're putting this together? Not a single one. That's Not good. a single one. Every I found this wonderful guy in Florida who assembled the book for me, did all the mechanical stuff. I'm totally inept with anything with oh, computers. Yeah. yeah, that's not I easy to do. do. <laughs> no, I, I just learned how to operate a toaster last week, you know, and, and, and this guy just just aced it. He was wonderful and uh, it put it all together and effortless, and there it was. And and uh, and the book has legs. I think I, I think I told you my 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 sponsor is part of a uh, founded a, a, a magnificent rehab uh, uh, in Camden, Maine, and because he's become very well known in the in the uh, in that community nationwide. He bought a dozen books, sent them out to all these other rehabs. They all ordered boxes and boxes of books. And so I gave him 50 more. I said, here, go, <laughs> you go girl. And you get these things out there. And they did. And, and so we'll, we'll, so it, you know, I'm, it, because it's, uh, I'm self published. I have no publicist. I have no organization pushing this thing. I have to do it myself. So I think it, it has a momentum and people buy it, they read it and then they buy it as presents. And we're putting little ads now on on Facebook, and the, the the title is "Someone You Know Needs This Book," which is, you know, once going back to the idea that it isn't it isn't just about alcohol addiction; it's about the messy business of life. Right, right. Yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of the lot. You know, I could see somebody who isn't an alcoholic, never been to an AA meeting, doesn't want to go to an AA meeting could read that and a lot and everything that you read in there, you can apply to life because that's what we talk about in meetings. We don't talk so much about our drinking as we do our living. Yeah. It's like the 12, it's like, it's like 12 steps. There's one step that talks about alcohol. Right. First step. And the rest talks about our living or how we live our lives. How do you, how do you, live, a, how do you live a peaceful, productive, happy life? Yeah. You know. Yeah. And then a lot of the, and as we know, a lot of the, a lot of what we have to work on, you know, once the alcohol leaves us, we just have our regular human condition that anyone, any, anybody has that we need to, to work on to live that peaceful existence or as peace, peace, peaceful as possible anyway. Yeah. Yeah. For us. I mean, what, what, what could be messier than alcoholics lives? <laughs> True. <laughs> if you want to, you, you know, go into it. And there was another, as I'm talking to you, John, I keep hearing all these things, these voices. There were, the, one of my f- absolute favorites was, I don't remember specifically what people told me when I came in, but I remember how it made me feel. Yeah, same here. And that was, that's kind of, how do you, you know, it, we we don't remember, we don't remember breadth. We remember moments, the life is a series of moments. And just having somebody say yeah me too what a what a gift and then somebody said actually listen to you they've actually listened to what you had to say and then and and give give you something back so how long did it take you to put this thing together i guess uh half a year okay and of course the 30 some years that you spent actually writing it but um... yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then a year actually assembling it you and I were came in about the same time initially. You, I, I think you're a far better person than I am because you stuck with it. You know, but but uh, uh, yeah, you, you, those all those years. But then the, the assembly, you know, it's like half a year. And it was, you know, it's just kind of nice to shuffle out of my bedroom over to my desk and just kind of peck away at it. Mm-hmm. And you got to see it um, come together. Yeah. Yeah. And realize you might have had, you may have something special there. Yeah. Well, you actually, you probably knew that in the beginning as you started the project. 
I knew I knew it was something wonderful. I've I've got God knows how many books I've gotten and the you know self help books and books about sobriety and so on and so forth. But nothing like this. There's nothing that just kind of tapped into the into the collective well, and and this this assembly of just just people talking. It was wonderful. And what's been the reaction? Well, as I said, you know, to, to sending these out to these rehab team ordering books, uh, I've gotten uh, uh, a lot of wonderful, uh, blushable reviews on Amazon. I wrote one last night. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> My hero. <laughs> if you come to New York, I'll buy you a nice cream. Thank you. But yeah, yeah. You know, it's a, you know and, and there's been hasn't been anybody that's responded to anything remotely negative. Other it's overwhelming. Maybe maybe the best thing I've done in my life, other than my two sons and, and uh, grandsons. Those are those. I are wonder good. if anybody recognized themselves in your book. I'm sure they would recognize. <laughs> but they said they won't see themselves. They won't. Uh huh. You know that that disclaimer that any that they do on motion pictures that. Anybody, uh, it's, it's purely coincidental, you know, any, any resemblance. Well, I think any resemblance would be delusional. Uh, so you, you aren't going to see yourself physically, but you will, the, and people have, have called and said, you thief. Uh, <laughs> well, people must have known too, as you're in meetings, because there's, we also have another person in our meeting, our home group, and I missed going to the meetings personally, but, uh, who would sketch people during meetings. And I love that. I love that. And again, I just think it was his way of being able to focus and pay to, and, and, and to be calm and focus. And, uh, it's, uh, so, but you know, I, who knows, maybe someday he'll put together a similar, a similar piece of work. Please. I mean, there's, 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 there's so much out there to share. What do you gain by hoarding it? What do you gain by ignoring it? How much do you get by just sticking it in the closet and forgetting about it? So do you ever have anybody in meetings as you were taking notes that asked you what you were doing or were concerned about it? In the traditional meetings in my first decade, I would, people would, would ask about it. Um, yeah. You know, and some, and some people, are you drawing me? <laughs> no. No, I'm not drawing you. Look, you're you're are you bald? Are you a man? You're 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 a 53 year old woman, 25 year old bald guy. You know, um, in the in the in the uh, humanist uh, meetings, uh, people are are far cooler about the. You know, they just they they know they know what's going on. I gotta go to that group next time I go to New York, which who knows when that will be. But um, my wife and I used to go to New York frequently. And the last time that I went, I, and I've mentioned this on a podcast before because I, I would just love the meeting so much, but I went to a meeting in the hell's kitchen area and it was, it was a regular meeting. It wasn't a secular meeting or a humanist meeting, but the people were so, so damn nice. And I just felt like I just, I felt like I was at home and I felt like it was a really special experience to be at that meeting and then um, one of the people in the meeting, she took me and showed me where there was a coffee shop like around the corner. And I went to that coffee shop and spent a few hours there. And uh, this is a real, real special experience. So after that experience, I think that was probably last time. That was the last time I was in New York. It's hard to believe. So that's been five years ago. And I told myself, every time I go to New York, I'm going to have to go to a meeting. And I need to check out some of these secular meetings in New York because um, I've just never took the time to do that. They're wonderful. They're, they're absolutely marvelous. Uh, by the way, in, in the uh, uh, atheist humanist meetings in Hell's Kitchen, they've renamed it Hex Kitchen. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyway, come to New York because now you're getting an ice cream cone out of the deal too. But it would be fun to to to, to go to some. The, these meetings are just. Oh, I rave about them. I just, you know, and this is, you know, it's kind of, it sounds so corny, but they are kind of family. Yeah. In a way, you know, we're in, we're, we're AA or we're, we're loaders of the herd instinct, you know, and we find one another and they're just, you walk in there and people just feel like people just love the meetings. And when I started the, 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 the humanist meeting on Monday, the humanist two, um, 
uh, meeting. We uh, it, it started out initially to be like three people or five people or two people or I thought this thing's never going to take off. Now there's like 20, 30, 40 people there. So it's gotten a lot bigger. Where do you guys meet at? Uh, church, church basements. We had, we had one meeting. We tried to do a, um, we tried to do a step meeting a humanist step meeting, uh, which was kind of doomed by the nature of the psyche of the people who attend meetings like that. Who are not conforming, right? Who don't who resist uh, structure and rule, and it was good because we the, the steps were re. It was a common. I rewrote the steps. Right, did you write that version that's in your book? I thought that was excellent. I, I've I've seen a lot of versions of the steps, but that one I thought probably was among the best I've seen. That just kind of um, shows the simplicity and practicality of them. Yeah. And, 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 but we had that meeting and it, it worked out. Uh, it, it went well for, for a time, good attendance. Then the church found out that we were a, not a, a Christian organization oh. or whatever. And they kicked us out. Oh, I can't believe that. Don't go to St. James Church anymore. Oh, no. okay. Are they, are they, they're not Episcopal? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Well, our group meets at a Unitarian Universalist church, and of course they're friendly. And then um, the other, the Free Thinkers group here in Kansas City, pre-COVID, they met at an Episcopal church, and they knew that that group was um, an agnostic atheist group, and they welcomed them. Oh, I, I was raised Unitarian. Oh, were you? you know, so, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, that that church is so popular that you can't, there's no, there's no space. I probably would be space now, but um, so we, we, so instead of the humanist step meeting, we, we renamed it a humanist with a twist. Ah, oh, okay. So that, that, that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good too. I like that. Now, I actually tried a meeting in KC that didn't go over too well. It was we have a we had a lot of uh, people that had never been to an AA meeting before in their lives, a regular AA meeting, and they're like in their twenties, thirties, maybe early forties, and they didn't really know anything about the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. All they knew is their experience and their secular group. We don't bother reading any of the original literature and so forth. So I thought, okay, I'm going to have this meeting. It's going to be a step meeting. And I'm going to teach these people about AA, right? And so I was. I wanted them to. I wanted them to appreciate the history of it. And it turned out to be hell because it was like um, they felt like it was a class. It was. It was like they felt like they had homework assignments they had to do. It didn't go over too well. So what we ended up doing with that meeting is we turned it into kind of like a um, book club, so that we would read a different book every month or however long it took us to go through the book. We just sit and read it and talk about it. Well, that? That's a great springboard. Yeah, it was a great meeting. That actually happened just, and then it was going along just great. And then COVID hit back in March. Right. And that's when we stopped meeting and we have not met in person since. Right. It's, it's always struck me uh, curiously that, that there's so many, uh, the, the AA agnostic humanist, uh, 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 atheist meetings tend to be attended by older people, people over 40 or whatever. Young people, for some reason or other, I, I gravitate toward having a lot of structure and rules. And I, I some, don't... Yeah, I know. I noticed that. Um, there, I've noticed that too. In fact, in the early days of our group, that, um, that kind of bothered me. It was like, but in a way I kind of understand it because I remember when I, when I got here, I said, just give me a damn book and show me what to do, you know, and I'll do it, you know, and I think people want that structure. And when you tell them that, you know, it's really, it's really pretty simple. You just don't drink. You go to these meetings. <laughs> it's like, it doesn't seem like that. That's going to really do it. You know, <laughs> yeah, they want a Harry Potter experience. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah it, 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 you might, my, the sponsor that I referred to, the, the one who helped with the books, his, uh, his daughter who was born, uh, just uh, just after I came into the program, who's now 31, I guess, <clears throat> is, it turned out to be one of my best friends, and she's in the program. And, and, and she spoke at one of our meetings, and I said, I, you know, it's so rare that I get to introduce a speaker whose diapers I've changed. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
and she's very enormously intelligent. She's just one of them. I just love her to, like my own child. Uh, she doesn't connect. She can't connect. She goes off to these these other meetings. She contributed. She she wrote the forward. Her name's Georgia. Mm. You read her okay. her thing at the very beginning of the book, and she would. And, and uh, all honesty, I should probably split the royalties. Where the royalties, no royalties, I'm making <laughs> very little money to be made on these books. Because she would she would send me things that she'd heard. Uh, so there were a few that were just irresistible. I tried to keep it to things that were, uh, you know, first person, but and there were a few awesome. quotes that you put in there that you just that you just enjoyed. I think uh, oh, there was a Mark Twain quote. I think maybe you yeah, put in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Which is my, good. Uh, yeah, it, I have these two sons, and when my life collapsed around my ears, they were four and eight, and uh, I and I had uh, we had co what do you call po, co parent and co what's the word I'm looking for uh, custody joint custody. So on nights when I couldn't find a babysitter, they would come to meetings with me. They'd sit there in the back row with doing their homework, you know, because you, know, you got to get to those meetings. Um, and they they picked up things. Not, neither one of them has has any kind of problem with any drugs or alcohol. Touch you know, touch wood or whatever. Um, the youngest son had a girlfriend once whose father was in the program. She was from Florida, and he would say things. She said, "My dad says the same thing," you know. With the universality of this thing, you know, it was really, really interesting. I forgot to put that in the book. I should have. <laughs> Maybe I'll do it in the next book called "Son of Twenty Five Years of Listening." You know, there you go. Yeah. yeah. So how how's how's uh, you know I forgot to even look to see when this thing when this was published. When did you finally publish the book? Uh, October. Really? Of this year? Yep, this, interesting. Yeah, this, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah, I thought it. Well, I thought it was. Good. I was fairly recently, but I didn't know it was that recently. Yeah, it's just it's just you know, and it's selling hundreds of copies. It's really oh, that's great, miraculous. I'm, you know, I really. How has this impacted you personally? I'm sorry. How has this impact impacted you personally on a personal level? To to know that there are people reading and and and, and enjoying and getting something out of your work. Um. Well, it's grat. I mean, gratification is probably. The, you know this, this we're, we're service right we're there to, we're, we're there to serve and help i had, I had a guy call, a young guy called me uh today and he said thank you so much for taking the time He's counting days and he said i really appreciate you taking the time you're helping so much i said you have to understand that you are helping me more than i'm helping you trust me you'll if you stick around long enough you'll understand that someday but this giving of this stuff is is helping me so much it kind of refocuses my my program refocuses my attention and i'm still taking notes like crazy it's just i'm doing it off screen at a zoom meeting it, it never stops this is a river that never dries up it just flows well i think my my experience podcasting is somewhat similar to that um i you know, when I got, when I started on this journey, I did, I had no idea how many people would be reached by this podcast and how it would impact them. And then after, after you start hearing from people who will tell you how much it has helped them, it's like, it's hard for me to believe that, but, but like your book, it's not me. It's these other people that are sharing the stories. I just give them a microphone and they talk and it's their stories that are helping people. It's not really anything that that I'm doing. I'm just the conduit to bring conduit, them. yeah, yeah co conduits today. <laughs> yeah. So, so anyway, so anyway, I, I I enjoyed your book. I would encourage people to check it out. It's um, you can find it on Amazon, and uh, it's uh, it's also on Kindle. I have actually both versions, the Kindle version and the paperback version. I prefer the paperback. I think I think a book like this is better. Of course, that's me and my age. You know, I'm sure that if I was like 30 years younger, I'd probably want the electronic version. <laughs> but but I like the paper version the best. But I think people, the people that I've talked to, I talked to somebody just this morning and said I keep writing notes in the in the column 
I mean, if you do that on your Kindle screen with a Sharpie, you're going to really screw up your, your Kindle and, and underlining things or highlighting or whatever it is. Cause there's, you know, not everything applies, not everything is worth noting, but there are things. And once you've connected with them, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's a great way to. I like the way it's formatted too, with a different font and uh, text size. Yeah, if you, that, that was the thing. I mean, if you just put this thing in like standard ten point type all the way through, oh my god! Yeah, yeah that would be too. That would be unbearable, wouldn't it? Yeah, this this is this is actually very gentle to read. But yeah, I never, I didn't think about that. Um, that that must not have been easy to to have to format every you know paragraph differently. <laughs> no, and, I, and, I'm not, and I'm as I pointed out at the beginning, I'm not very skilled with anything to do with computers, so I would do something that would screw up everything for 60 pages you know i have to go back, oh god i do this all over again but i think i think it's worth it i think it's because you get to emphasize things you know there's one 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 thing that took up an entire page and said there there are a thousand bullshit excuses for picking up a drink but not one reason that devoted an entire an entire page to that very simple reality it's funny i just i just opened up a page and i, and I, I love this one don't cling to a mistake just because you spent a lot of time making it. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah. That was that was my sponsor, Gene. Oh, really? <laughs> yes. He, you know, he used to talk about. Uh, oh, he was just he was this guy who came in, as I said before, an enormously uh, intelligent man, a psychiatrist trained in Switzerland, the whole thing, and did not recognize his own alcoholism until he was in his mid 60s came in at 67 he died a few months short of his 20th anniversary and and he would he would just and he and an atheist you know jewish a jewish atheist right and he would he would speak enviously of how he would work with people uh, it, it meshed in hysterical misery for months, weeks, years, whatever, just trying to elevate them into normal unhappiness. That was the goal, right? Then he would come to an AA meeting and see somebody struggle through the door, just bowed low with the weight of failure and addiction and all this, this soul-crushing life experience. 60 minutes later, prance out the door, on a brand new life course. And he'd say, you know, how the hell does this, how do we do this? What happens? What happens in there? What, how, how is this possible? So envy, envy, you know. Yeah. He said, I'm not going to call it a miracle. You know, a, 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 if you put a tutu on a, on, a, on a turtle and starts flying around the living room, yeah, it's a miracle, right? This is all within the realm of human experience. There's something that's so powerful in the uh, I can understand why people do think it's divine and it, and it, it's miraculous because it does feel that way. And, you know, when you go from, from active alcoholism to being sober, the, the, the difference is so stark and that you would spend, you know, in my case, not as many years as many other people have spent, but when you spend so many years in addiction, oh man, it's, it, it's a pretty hopeless condition. So yeah, to be free from that does seem like a miracle, but actually it's just uh, people helping each other. It is, and and you know, I I, I you know I, I was a, a smoker, <clears throat> two pack a day guy, hardest thing I ever gave up in my life, just excruciating. When you give up smoking, and you announce it, people say, "Good for you, way to go!" Right? You see, I gave up drinking. It's a miracle. <laughs> I went. I, I I I look at you, John. You have a lovely face. You have a wonderful voice. You're clearly a, a, a an intelligent man, and, and it's so much fun talking to you. And I feel better and stronger and happier having had this experience. And I'll go to my meeting tonight. I'll chat about this, and you know, and I'll, and I'll get the same the same bounce back. And it's it's that's that's where it is for me. It's a uh, well, no, say hello no, to everybody I, for me at the meeting. I shall. I will. <laughs> And I'm not looking to God to solve any of this stuff. He's so busy burning down uh, Notre Dame and creating tsunamis. He's got his hands full. I've, I've, I've worked on my own issue. 
Well, I've enjoyed this conversation. Thank you very much for coming on. I really appreciate it. I love the book, and I hope that um, this podcast will get the word out to even more people so they can discover it. Thanks, John. And I, and I owe you an ice cream cone. I will take you up on that. Okay. <laughs> and that's it. That's another episode of AA Beyond Belief, the podcast. Thank you so much for listening. Um, if you'd like to help out our website and podcast, you can do so by a couple of ways. Uh, go on over to patreon.com slash AA Beyond Belief and become a patron. We're starting to do things now for people who are supporting us on Patreon by you know, releasing podcasts a little bit early so you can hear them beforehand, etc. But um, we would appreciate the support if you can do it. If not, that's okay, too. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back again real soon. Bye-bye.